looking at the lowest two octaves that can be, let's say, reliably produced. And by looking at those, we determined a few very particular things. First of all, in everything we tested across genre, different producers over a series of time, we're talking, I think, in the last like eight years for all of the different tracks to come out, different mix engineers, different styles of production, but continuity existed across all of them. And not only did, was there a specific subset of continuities, certain genres had specific rules associated with them. But the one thing that was present across all is there was a very um, particular use of a sustained low frequency element and a transient low frequency element across all of them. And that could be as simple as an 808 with a kick top it could be as simple as a sub patch running from a digital or analog synth with some kick accoutrement. It could even be in the case of like Moody Good, there's an audible kick in the higher range, but the actual transient design in the low end is more like psychological. That doesn't change the fact that it is moving in transient versus sustained level, that the transients are peaking at higher levels than the sustained elements are. So you still end up with a, there's a transient element and there's a sustained element. But either way, even in that sort of outlier scenario where Moody Good has just made a tacky kick to go on top of a huge bass, it still, uh, C conforms to the formatting. There is a sustained element and there is a transient element and that's it. And they marry incredibly well. And so that brought us into, okay, let's start looking at how these elements actually work. Let's start looking at how they all jibe together and let's start finding out ways that we can jibe them with each other. And so that's what this session is today. Let's get into it a little bit more. So the last time we were in here, let me activate this puppy. Last time we were in this piece, um, we were in the lows. I believe we had the 808 on. I believe we had the kick options on. Let me get this operator off. And this is something like what we were working with. And so we had people were asking questions specifically about, do you ever need to pitch the kick top sometimes with the sub? And uh, that can be a potentiality that we might need. But I'm just going to go through here and continue demonstrating uh, the ways in which to marry. <clears throat> because it's just, I don't feel like you can, I don't feel like you can do this enough. So I'm going to get into a different type of kick. There's a lot of like, it's really easy, I think. When you have a really clean, like most of my trap kicks that I've mined are very clean. It's like, maybe even you're like, is that the same kick a million times? They're very uh, uniform. They're meant for a level of punch. And again, they kind of have their own sustain element in them. But for the most part, they're really clean. However, I do have some style kicks that are genuinely different. And let's see what we got going on in here. There we go. So oftentimes, Woofy, boom bap, not a clean tail. They can be awesome, like, um, layers, and they can be great at providing punch, but when it comes to the actual marriage, usually the, comp the waveform is incredibly complex. Let's find one of those. Where are you at? Yeah, it just sounds like it's going to be... Bizarre. Yeah, there we go. <clears throat> uh, I don't even know. Like, what's all this in this crest? Like, okay, extra frequencies. Blah. So it's just kind of mismatch. Uh, still a positive zero crossing, which is nice. But, I mean, jeez. That's not going to marry well. Um, or at least it's going to be difficult. So in this scenario, I wanted to kind of start using a couple of these kids 
just to showcase that the same um, process of going about uh, nailing the kick into the sub, where the sub takes precedence, the 808 takes precedent, but only in the sense of it is the thing connecting our bottom end to the key of the song. That's it. It's like that's why we do the sub or the 808 first, because we're, we have to marry the kick to that, not the other way around. We want to make sure that the kick gets tuned, the kick gets repitched, the kick fits into the key of the piece. So I'm going to just layer these kicks on top of each uh, of the re-triggers within the sub. <clears throat> and that's going to make uh, probably a bunch of soup. But let me get this kick up a bit so we can really hear it. <clears throat> Right away, like, I mean, the 808 is definitely has more energy in the low end. But it's just cleaner without that top kick in there. I can hear it kind of choking away from the bottom end. And let me demonstrate what that sounds like to you all. So now we're listening to that lowest octave only. This is the 30 to 60 hertz. <clears throat> and we should be able to notice this will just clean up a little bit when I unsolo the style kick. Just smoother, cleaner. I can hear a little shudder in there, which would make sense that this is such a complex waveform and the frequency is adjusting over time that we just don't have a clean bottom end signal in there. And especially if I start getting in here, I mean, look at this. This is just all over the place. So. So one of the first things that I'm noticing just by boosting in here around 44 hertz is I'm getting a bit of a double syllable right now. It's like, there's this like rattle that's happened. And so I can, let's go back into here. Let's go over here, get to our like single trigger one shot. And let's just play with the transpose a little bit. That's a little nicer. Ooh. That's definitely cleaned it up. So let's come back up here. You can really hear that double, triple transient. <laughs> Now I am still hearing a vabap. It's like rap, what, what? So I'm gonna play with the phase and just see. No, so you can hear right away there. There's our great indicator of phase. If you're trying to learn if something is phase correlated or not, you can flip your inputs um, phase inverted on your utilities and note the change. And so in this scenario, I'm going to grab the utility back off again. In this scenario, I am able to listen, just listen to the intensity shift with this on and off. So here's before. You can see it on the meters too. Peaking like cray. Not peaking nearly as much, more subdued. The punch is gone. And so that's an indicator to me that we are in phase and things are actually working. Now, what does this sound like without just listening to that lowest band? It's a little boomy, but I can come in here now. And one of the nice things about these like woofy kind of beady kicks is there's usually good stuff in here. And then in this scenario, I'm going to do the G-Love engineer trick, and I'm going to get rid of 200 a little bit, which is the basketball frequency. Bye-bye, basketball. Nice. These are the best practices, children. 
And then I can come in here to the top. All right. Ah! Niku with the all pass question. Great question. Um, so I'll get into Niku's question with the all pass stuff in just a second. Um, but for now, let's go before and after on this. Now, you can hear at the very end of this kick, in the decay phase, it is not super clean. It's still a little rattly. And there is just not a lot we can do in this kick unless we start getting into like the pitch envelope, which is totally fine to do. Let's just play with that for a second. See if I can pitch it down into the root note. There we go. It's a little cleaner with the pitch envelope. Still a little rattly though on the back end. Although I do like it better. And then I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna truncate the waveform again and just get that Just get that attack phase in there. And then on something trashy like this, uh, compression can be helpful. I don't know if it's gonna work, but let's just see. Cha-ching. And uh, I can duck this from the style kick. And we're cooking with gas. Just so knocky. Trashy, knocky, but it all fits together, and we're using something incredibly complex. 